So to go on through the rest of chapter seven, we're going to focus in on the axial skeleton. Now, guys, this is also going to be what's covered in lab nine. So this will be kind of a review of that particular lab. So the divisions of the skeletal system are the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Now the axial skeleton is what we're going to focus in on here. The adult human skeleton consists of 206 bones. 80 of these bones are part of the axial skeleton. So this is going to be the skull, the cranial bones, there are eight of them. The facial bones are 14. There's the hyoid bone, the auditory bones that are inside the ear. There's six of them, but we're going to not talk about them here in this chapter. They'll be talked about in chapter 17 in anatomy too. The vertebral column, there's 26 of them. The thorax is made of the sternum and 24 ribs. Now the appendicular skeleton will be discussed in the next presentation and that's going to be composed of 126 bones. So let's focus here on the axial skeleton. So we're going to look at the bones of the skull first. So the skull is made of cranial bones and facial bones. You have to have both of these in order to make a complete skull. There are eight cranial bones and there are 14 facial bones. And so you end up getting a skull that looks like this, very similar to your pictures here. Now, you'll notice in your textbook or your lab book that the, the skull is color coded. That would be awesome if it really was, but it's not. And so we need to be able to identify the different bones based on more of a model like this. So if we're looking at this with the eight cranial bones, they're going to be bones that make up your brain case. You have one frontal, two parietal, two temporal, one occipital, one sphenoid, and one ethmoid bone. We're also in this section going to talk about the sutures, fontanelles, and the, the paranasal sinuses. We'll then come back to the facial bones in a minute. So with these cranial bones, you can see here in this picture that you have several different types. So we do see here in the very, very front is the frontal bone. This is the forehead. So we have the frontal bone here right on the forehead. We also have the parietal bone here. You have one on each side. That's why there's two of them. Okay. We also have the temporal bone, which is over here by the ear. Okay. And again, you have one on the opposite side as well. And then we have one occipital bone. The occipital bone is back here. Now, on the outer structure that you see here on the skull, it's very difficult to see the sphenoid bone and the ethmoid bone. Those are more internal, okay? We can see a little piece of the ethmoid when we look here in the eye socket, and we can see the sphenoid if we go back behind the zygomatic arch, your cheekbone. But these two bones are gonna be more internal. Now, the sphenoid is like the keystone. It's very critical for the whole formation of the skull to stay in place, okay? And so it's really important um, to have that sphenoid bone, and you'll see that in a minute. So when we look at the frontal bone, we do need to look at it with some markings, okay? So we have the frontal bone, which is located here. We also see that there's what we call the, sup the supraorbital foramen. Now, if you'll recall back from the lecture on the markings, a foramen is a hole, right? And so you can kind of see it right here. It's marked. That's a hole right there. That's going to be the supra above the orbit foramen. We also see that there's the supraorbital margin, which is going to be right here. This is what we see as being your um, eyebrows, okay? So this part right here where this margin is, that's going to be the eyebrows. We see that the roof of the orbit is going to extend posteriorly to form the floor of the cranial cavity. So this part right here is going to go posterior to form the floor of the cranial cavity. So this is the front frontal bone. All right, so now I'm going to take the jaw off here and we're going to look at the temporal bone with some of its markings. Now the temporal bone here in this picture is in the purple. All right, so if we take a look here, the temporal bone is going to be right in here. So here's the temporal bone right here, one on each side. So we're going to look at it from the bottom. So we do see that there is what we call the zygomatic process. That's right here. It's reaching towards the zygomatic bone. This is why it's called the zygomatic process. We also see right here that there's a fossa, this indention, this is going to be the mandibular fossa, and it's going to be where the mandible is going to connect. This is known as your TMJ. So it's your temporal mandibular joint. That's where TMJ comes from. We also see that right here is the external auditory meatus for your ear. This little projection that you see here is the styloid, and this is going to be attachment for your tongue and your neck muscles. And then we also have this bump right here, which is behind your ear, that we call the mastoid process. And this is going to help attachment with your neck muscles as well. 
All right, so staying on this inferior side, let's look at the occipital bone. The occipital bone is back here at the back of the head. We do see that there are the occipital condyles. Remember, the condyles look like little knuckles, and you can see them right here. They're labeled number 19 on this particular skull. Okay, these are going to articulate with your first vertebrae called the atlas, and they are going to help you be able to say yes. Okay, so they're going to help you be able to go yes. Okay, moving those back and forth. We also see the large hole that's here. This is the foramen magnum. This is where your medulla oblongata and your spinal cord are going to attach. This is where it's going to transition from that, uh, spi that uh, brain stem to the spinal cord as it leaves. We also see that this area right here, this is going to be the external occipital protrudence. This is going to be attachment for ligaments that help support your head. All right, so this is what you're looking at. Now, guys, if you look in your lab book, you will see that there's a lot more markings that are present. These are just the ones that are going to be important because they're going to come back in further chapters throughout Anatomy 1 and Anatomy 2. All right, so now we're going to look at the sphenoid bone. Now, the sphenoid bone, this is where they've actually taken a mid-sagittal cut, and you're looking in or into the skull. They've taken the sphenoid out to let you look at it. Now, the sphenoid bone does have what we call these greater and lesser wings, okay? And they are going to be that keystone of the brain case. And so, guys, you can kind of, if I hold it like this... Okay, you can see them here. This right here is going to be those wings that we see. Okay, so these are the greater wings that are present right in here. Okay, and you can see them right there. They're, they look kind of like a set of wings that are located there. Now, there is a very, very important structure that's found on the sphenoid bone that you de do need to know. It's the saddle-like structure. We see where my finger kind of goes in right here. It's a saddle-like structure right here. It's known as the cella tersica, and this is actually where the pituitary gland is going to sit when it's attached to your brain. Now, this is important because the pituitary gland is like the master gland of your endocrine system, of your hormones, and it's the connection between your brain and the endocrine system. So this bone helps protect protect it and it's known as the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. Now, the next one we see is the ethmoid bone. Now, to me, guys, the ethmoid bone kind of looks like an alien spaceship. Um, if you were to kind of try to put it into some sort of shape, um, this is what you see here in this picture. And so if you're looking here at the front, little pieces of this could be seen in the eye socket and in the nose. But for the most part, it's going to be more internal. Now, in the nose area, there are these structures called the concha. These are swirls, and they're going to help filter your air that you inhale. So the superior concha are found here on the ethmoid bone. They're also going to aid in directing the materials or the particles that you breathe in for smell. We also see that there's a perpendicular plate that's going to be running this way. This perpendicular plate is going to form part of your nasal septum, which is going to divide your nose into a right and left side. Okay, and so a lot of times when somebody has a deviated septum, this perpendicular plate is what's been broken and it's off to the side. A few other things that are important on this ethmoid bone are the crista galli. The crista galli is this cone shaped structure at the very top. This Crista galli is, is attachment for the meninges that are going to be protecting your brain. So that's really important. And you can see it right here. Okay, so you can see it right here inside of the skull. It's this raised area in in their part of the skull. This is called the crista galli. Now, just below the crista galli is what we call the cribiform plate. It runs this way. All right, so the perpendicular ran this way. The cribiform runs across transverse wise. This is going to have little tiny holes. And again, if you look on each side of them, you see the tiny little holes. Those are known as foramina, meaning tiny holes. And this is actually going to be where your olfactory nerves for smell come up to deliver their messages. All right, so that's going to be helpful for your a sense of smell. All right, so the next thing I want to talk to you about are the cranial sutures of the skull. A suture, guys, is an immovable joint that's between your skull bones, and it helps hold these bones together. So we do see that there's a number of sutures that are present. And so the first one is called the coronal suture, and it's the one that runs right here with your frontal a bone connecting to your parietal bones. Okay, it's called the coronal, coronal suture, and think about it as that coronal cut, if you were to cut right here. Okay, it's going to unite the frontal and the parietal bones. We also see that there is going to be a sagittal suture, which runs right down here the middle. Okay, think about it, remember, as a sagittal cut down here in the middle. So this is a sagittal suture between the two parietal bones. Okay, we also see that there is... 
in this case this is going to be the squamous suture it's going to unite the parietal bones with the temporal bone so this is the squamous and then back here at the back this one that's going to unite the parietal bones to the occipital is known as the lamboidal suture so these are the sutures that you need to make sure that you know now, something else we wanted to discuss are called fontanelles. These are soft spots. Um, these are found in babies. This is going to be where these areas are not fully bone and they are filled with that mesenchyme tissue. If you recall, mesenchyme is the embryonic type of connective tissue. This is going to be present at birth and they close at various times, um, anywhere between two months of age up to two years. And they're going to close by that intramembranous ossification that we talked about back in chapter number six. Now they do become what we call these sutures that we just saw on the previous slide in adults. Now the whole function of these fontanelles is to provide flexibility during the birthing process so that it can slide across and it's not, it's not squishing the brain, but it also allows for the brain to grow during those first two years. All right, so you can notice them here. So in the fetal skeleton or even in the newborn, you're going to see that there's not going to be those sutures present like we saw on the slide before. They will close up though to form those sutures. Another thing we wanted to discuss that's part of this whole idea of that cranial case is these paranasal sinuses. Now these sinuses are mucous membrane lined air cavities in the in your skull bones and the whole point is they're going to help drain mucus from the nasal cavity. So as the mucus drains from the nasal cavity it's going to go into these openings. Now these paranasal sinuses are found in several of the bones. There's some in the frontal bones right in here. There's some in the ethmoid bones right here behind the no nose as well as the sphenoid and then we also see some in the maxilla bones which are part of your facial bones. Now the function of these paranasal sinuses are to humidify and warm the air that you inhale. It also helps you reduce the weight of your skull so your skull is not so heavy since those bones are not going to be solid and it helps you resonate your vocal sounds. This is why when you have a sinus infection or an allergy um, kind of thing that's going on and this is all stuffy and you get the pain all in here from the sinus infection or up here in the head you sound different because the the sound is not being able to resonate in open cavities they're full of mucus and so it does cause your voice to sound different now sinitis is when there's inflammation in these mucosal membranes again they can affect your sound and a sinus headache is when pressure is built up due to the lack of drainage All right, so now we're gonna move on and talk about the 14 facial bones. So we talked about the eight cranial, now let's do the 14 facial. You have one mandible, two maxilla bones, two zygomatic bones, two nasal, two lacrimal, two palatine, two inferior nasal concha, and one vomer that we're gonna take a look at. So when we look at this and we look at the side of the skull, you're gonna notice that you can see several of the bones. You have the nasal bone, which is right here, which is gonna make the bridge of your nose where your glasses would sit. We see here this area right here that's your cheekbone. This is gonna be the zygomatic bone. If you'll notice, the zygomatic bone reaches towards the temporal bone where you have the zygomatic uh, process. This is the temporal process, zygomatic process, and together this makes your zygomatic arch or your cheek bone. We also have the maxilla, which is this area here. It's the upper part of your jaw. Okay, it does articulate with all of your other facial muscle or bones except the mandible. And then, we, of course, we have the mandible here. I've taken it off, okay, but you can see the mandible here. The mandible is your lower jaw. It's the largest and it's the only movable bone in your whole head. Okay, these all bones are, are kind of like cemented together. This is the only one that can move. So if we look here and they do again a section where you're looking into the actual skull, you can again see the nasal bones. The inferior nasal concha you're going to see inside of the nose and it's hard to see it here as well as the vomer. The vomer is difficult to see because it's back behind this area. The palatine bone is going to be the back of your mouth, so that hard palate at the back of your mouth. And then of course the mandible is shown in this picture as well. So if we're going to look at the front area, okay, so when we look here, you have your nasal bones, one on each side, just below those, right in the corner, kind of right by the corner of your eye is going to be the lacrimal bones. These are the smallest facial bones, and they're going to house your tear ducts, which help you drain your tears into your nasal cavity. We also have the zygomatic bone, which has its temporal process going towards the temporal bone. 
Back here in the nose, you can see we have the vomer. It's gonna articulate with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and help make the rest of your nasal septum. We have the maxilla, which is the top part, the mandible, which is your bottom jaw, okay? And we do see that we have the inferior nasal concha inside the nose. It's this kind of swirly area in here. These are not part of the ethmoid bone. They're a whole different bone and they're the inferior concha. The superior concha are part of the ethmoid bone. So when we look at these facial bones, we do see that the maxilla is going to have what we call the infraorbital foramen. That's gonna be a small hole right here. Okay, this is gonna allow, this is gonna allow for the movement of certain blood vessels and nerves through. We also see that this guy has what we call the alveolar processes, which are going to contain your teeth sockets where the teeth are going to be able to fit in. Okay, on the hard palate or the roof of your mouth, you're gonna notice that it's partially the maxilla and it has what we call the palatine process, which meets, it meets back here to the palatine bones, these palatine bones. When these do not fuse together completely to make this hard palate of your, th of your mouth, we see that it's called a cleft palate. It's an incomplete fusion of this hard palate and it means that there's an opening from here straight into the nose like you see here in this picture. All right, so let's take a look here at the mandible. When we're looking at the mandible, the mandible has several markings we need to know. We do see that there's the mandibular condyles here. Remember those knuckle-shaped structures? They're gonna articulate with the mandibular fossa on the temporal bone to help form your TMJ. We also have what we call the coronoid process. This is process right here. This is for muscle attachment. Okay, we also have the mandibular foramen. These are little holes right in here. And this is gonna be passage of, again of nerves and blood vessels into the mandible. We also have the mental foramen. They're right here on each side, these tiny little holes. And think about it, when you think about something, like little kids and they say, and they're like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, I'm thinking. And they put their hand right here. They're putting their hands on their mental foramen. Okay, so think about it that way. We also see the alveolar sockets, which are gonna contain the teeth. We also see on here, we have the ramus, which is going to be the arm of the mandible. And then of course, the body of the mandible runs across here. Okay, so the mandible has lots of different markings that you should know. Another thing that's really unique here is the orbit of the eye. Um, this in the skull is made up of multiple bones of your cranial and facial bones. So if you look here, your eye socket is going to be a combination of your frontal ethmoid and sphenoid bone, which are all parts of the cranial bones. And then you also see the lacrimal, palatine, maxilla, and zygomatic bones. And so this is a big deal because you also see that the fissures are located in here. These are created by the combination of these bones. And this is one reason why when we have a broken cheekbone and things like that, where there's an issue with the eye socket, it's such a big deal because there's so many bones that if they get shifted around, it can cause some major problems. All right, so now we're gonna move out of the head and we're gonna talk about the other axial skeletal muscles as we move down. So the next we wanna look at is the hyoid bone. Now the hyoid bone is a kind of unique looking bone. A lot of times it looks like it has little vampire teeth right here on it. Okay, this right here is the hyoid. The hyoid does not articulate with any other bone. It is the only bone in the body that does not touch another bone. It's actually suspended between your mandible and your larynx, which is your voice box right in this area. It's gonna be a site of attachment for your tongue. So your tongue attaches way back here, as well as some of your neck muscles. All right, so this is a really big deal when we talk about the hyoid. Now the hyoid can be a really important um, tool when we talk about looking at cause of death. When they look at the hyoid, if it has been, if it has been uh, fractured or it's broken, there's a good chance that that person was actually strangled, okay? Because this bone will break when somebody has been strangled. All right, so the next one we wanna look at is the vertebral column. Um, we do see that your spine is composed of a series of bones that are called the vertebrae. Now, all vertebrae do consist of certain characteristics, and then there's gonna be some differences between the cervical, thoracic, and the lumbar. But all vertebrae have three things in common. They do have what we call the body. The body is going to be this part, which is the weight-bearing part. We do see it has the peduncle and the um, lamella. This is gonna surround the spinal cord, so the spinal cord is going to travel through through this structure, okay, so it's gonna create that hole. And then we have these processes, these different points that come off of the vertebrae, which are gonna allow for attachment of muscles. All right, so all the vertebrae are going to have these three kind of basic structures. 
I guess it's really four basic structures. Now, when we look at the vertebral column, we do see that there's what we call the intervertebral foramen. These are gonna be formed for the exiting spinal nerves between each vertebrae. So as the vertebrae stack up, it's gonna create these little holes that the nerves are gonna be able to come out of. So they're in between the vertebrae. This is why they're called intervertebral. We do see that there's also the vertebral foramen, which is this hole here, which is where the spinal cord is gonna be housed. Okay, so we have some that are gonna come out from the sides, these little holes through the sides, which are gonna allow the nerves to come out. Those are intervertebral. This large hole here is the vertebral foramen. Now, we do see that for your vertebral column, there are gonna be discs in between each of these vertebrae. They are made out of tough fibrocartilage. Okay, this is going to help with cushioning, but also going to help with making sure things don't compress. So they're going to have a, a per absorbing shock and forming strong joints. Now these joints do prov provide some movement, but it does still leave some limited movement so your spine doesn't become severed. All right, so the vertebral column regions are divided into the cervical vertebrae. This is C C1 through C7, and they're the neck region. We then have the thoracic vertebrae, which is T1 through T12, and they are gonna help articulate with the ribs. And then we have the lumbar vertebrae, which is going to support the lower back. This is L1 through L5. We also see the sacrum and the coccyx. Now the sacrum is five fused vertebrae in adults, and the coccyx is four fused vertebrae in adults. These are not fused in kids, and so instead of having 26 vertebrae, children have 33 vertebrae, because that fusing of the sacrum and coccyx has not been completed yet. All right, so let's take a look here at the vertebrae. There are some differences when you look at the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae. And for one, you can notice the size. All right, so if we take a look here, this is a cervical vertebrae, and this is a lumbar. There's a big difference in the size that you can see. So with the cervical vertebrae, guys, these are found in the neck, and there are two vertebrae that do have specific names. We have the atlas and the axis. Now the atlas looks like this. Okay, so the atlas is gonna have this structure, and this is going to be the one that supports your head. These right here are going to be where those condyles from the occipital uh, bone are going to sit. This is going to help you be able to say yes. Okay, and so we see that there's no body with this particular vertebrae. Like in Greek mythology, they talked about how there was a man, and you've probably seen the picture with this man that has the world on his shoulders. He's like holding it up. That man was called Atlas. He's holding the world. And so this is actually holding your world, which is your head and your brain. Okay, just below that you have the axis. This is what the axis looks like. You'll notice it looks a little different too. And the reason it has this structure here called the dens. This is going to allow your head to pivot on it so that you can say no. So you can move your head back and forth. Okay, so this one also has a special name called the axis. And if you can think about it, this would be like if you put a wheel on it, you would allow the wheel to spin. It has an axis. So you have the atlas, okay, and then you have the axis. Now, when we look just at cervical vertebrae, you're going to notice that the body is very small on these vertebrae. They do have these little facets located here for articulation. They have the transverse foramina, which are from side to side, and they do have the bifold process. Okay, so they do have that bifold process. So without these first two specialized cervical vertebrae that help hold the head to the neck, we do see that your range of motion would be very limited. We need these two specialized looking vertebrae in order to allow you to be able to move your head in all directions. All right, so they're specialized to allow for that. So C1 is the atlas, C2 is the axis. All right, so now let's look at the thoracic vertebrae, which is the T1 through T12. These vertebrae are also unique in their shape and they are gonna articulate with ribs to form your thoracic rib cage. Now, we do see that they have these little coastal facets that are going to run over here on the sides. These facets are going to allow for rib attachment, and so if we take a look here, we can see that a rib, and this is a rib, you see how the rib would attach on here like this? See how it would attach? This is going to be those facets that allow for rib attachment on these particular vertebrae. We also do see that they have a, they do not have any trans, 
versus foramen. Okay, so they have no foramen. There's no holes here on the sides. They do have a little larger body than we saw in the cervical. So if you look, here's the cervical, here's the thoracic. It's a larger body. And their spinous process, guys, is longer and it projects inferiorly. Now, one thing to note, guys, is if you look at the actual thoracic vertebrae this way, do you notice it kind of looks like a giraffe's face? Okay, where it has the ears and the little horns and then the, the longer face of the giraffe, this is going to be a thoracic vertebrae. If it has this kind of structure, it's a thoracic vertebrae. We then go on to the lumbar vertebrae. The lumbar vertebrae are going to bear the greatest loads, and so they have to be much stouter and larger than the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. Again, you'll notice there's no transverse foramen. There's no holes through here. There's going to be where they have the largest body, and their spinous processes, guys, are going to be more blunt. See how they're going to be shorter and more blunt? And they project posteriorly, straight back. This is going to be a, allow for big muscle attachment. The last one here is the sacrum and the coccyx. So you have the sacrum and this little area here is the coccyx. The sacrum is a fusion of five separate vertebrae. You will notice that there's holes through here which are known as the sacral foramen. They're going to allow for nerves and stuff to pass through. Okay, we also see that this bottom part is the coccyx or the tailbone and it's a fusion of three to five separate vertebrae right here. Okay, so this would be the coccyx or the tailbone. Now, your vertebral column has several curvatures that are present, and some of these curvatures are primary curvatures that you were born with, and others are secondary that develop um, a little bit later through your life. So if you look here at this baby, you see that a fetus or even a newborn has a more single curve. This is why they can't hold their head up and they can't sit up, because their spine has just this one curve. This is called the primary curve. Now, as we grow, certain parts of our verte vertebral canal stays with this primary curve. The third thoracic and the sacral stay with that primary curve. So it makes more of a concave type of curve. However, as we start to develop as a baby and we start to hold our head up, the cervical vertebrae are going to change. The curve is going to turn into a more convex curve, which allows you to be able to hold your head up. This develops about the third month. We then see that the lumbar curvature is also going to become convex. We see the lumbar vertebrae is going to also turn into a convex type of curve, and this develops when you start to learn how to sit, stand, and walk. And so we do see then we have a new set of curvatures that take place that allow us to be able to stand upright. So this whole idea of having this double curvature type of system gives us balance, allowing us to um, distribute the weight of our body and remain on our feet, increase our strength and resilience, and also with some flexibility of the spine, and it also allows it to absorb shock better when you walk. Now, some curvatures of the spine are abnormal. They're, they are not the way that they should be. Now, one here is scoliosis. Now, scoliosis means that the spine's supposed to be lined up this way, but we have a lateral curvature that takes place. It moves off to the side, okay? We then see we have kyphosis. Kyphosis is where your thoracic curvature gets worse. This is known as like hunchback, okay? So it draws the shoulders down, causes a hunchback to take place. The last one's lordosis, or also known as swayback, and this is where the lumbar curve becomes more exaggerated. This does happen naturally in pregnancy because of the extra weight that is being carried in the front um, with the baby. However, it should go away after birth. So the thoracic cage is formed by the thoracic vertebrae along with the sternum and the ribs and coastal cartilage. The whole point of your thorax or thoracic cage is to enclose and protect your organs in the thoracic and parts of the abdominal cavity. Now, of course, with the thoracic cavity, this includes your heart and your lungs, but it also comes and extends downward a little bit and it's gonna help protect parts of your stomach and your liver. It's gonna provide support for the bones of the upper limbs, so it's gonna allow for there to be a connection with the upper limbs and it helps play a role in breathing because the muscles that attach to this thoracic cage are going to help you with your breathing. So when we take a look at this thoracic cage, we do see that you have the sternum. The sternum is also known as your breastbone. Okay, so in our skeletons we have here, this is going to be the sternum. Okay, this is going to be the side of attachment of the ribs, and these are showing you the cartilage where the ribs are going to attach. We do see that this is going to have an area that we call the manubrium, which is up here at the top, the body, and then the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process a lot of times is what breaks during CPR attempts. 
We do see that then you have 12 pairs of ribs. Now remember 12 pairs means that there's a total of 24. This gives structural support to your thoracic cavity. Now there are different types of ribs. There are true ribs, which are your upper seven ribs, and they attach directly to your sternum with the coastal cartilage. So if you look here, do you see how there's a direct connection to the sternum? These would be considered the true ribs. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. They directly attach. Now guys, if you look, these are the false ribs. If you'll notice here, these three cartilage attach here and then they attach to, these three will attach here and they go to the sternum. All right, so they don't directly attach, they direct they attach to cartilage within attaches. So these are known as the false ribs. So these are going to be what we consider eight, nine, and 10. The last ones are what we would consider the false floating ribs, and these are ribs 11 and 12. They do not attach at all to the sternum. This is why they're considered floating. Now the coastal cartilage you see here is going to be made out of hyaline cartilage, and it connects the sternum to the ribs. It's gonna to contribute to the elasticity of the thoracic cage so that when you take a deep breath in, it allows for it to expand, and then when you breathe out, it allows it to contract. All right, so this hyaline cartilage allows for that expansion to take place. All right, so when we take a look at a rib, okay, so when we have a look at the rib, the rib does have a head region. This head region is gonna articulate with the vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae. So this area is going to be what we consider the head of the rib. Other than that, there's not a whole lot else you need to know. The flattened area here is what's gonna connect to the coastal cartilage.